What is Jerusalem worth? Nothing. Everything. Let's go through the mention of Al-Aqsa in the Quran. Can you can you can you go through that for us? Al-Aqsa has actually been referenced in the Quran itself. Right. So if you look at chapter 17, verse 2 of the Quran, it mentions Glory be to him who carried his servant by night from the sacred mosque to the distant mosque, the inference of which we are blessed that we might show him some of our signs. Surely he alone is the hearing, the seeing. Now the sacred mosque that has been referenced, it references Mecca, Al-Haram, yeah. the mosque that famously know. And the distant mosque in Arabic, we can see has been called Al-Aqsa. Yeah. Now at that time, the misconception that a lot of Muslims have, and generally the general population has as well, is Al-Aqsa compound or mosque did not exist at the time. It wasn't a place as right. such, right? So Al-Aqsa here has another spiritual meaning to it. Well, I guess it has to because it wasn't there at the time. Yes. So there was no distant mosque there. So yeah. what actually, can you can you walk us through the actual yeah, so vision that has been described by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be so, upon him? Yeah, so the Muslims have this misconception that the Prophet Muhammad flew physically to from Mecca to Jerusalem. Yeah. And that he there, from there, had a spiritual vision experience. Then he went to heaven. But they think it was all physical. <laughs> they think it was all physical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but actually, these were two separate events. That's the first thing to mention as a misconception for the Muslims who may be watching this. The Isra is mentioned in Surah Bani Israel. It's exactly what you've referred to here. Or Surah Al-Isra. Surah Al-Isra, yeah. Um, the Isra is mentioned in Surah Al-Isra, that's right. <laughs> or Surah Bani Israel, 17th chapter of the Quran, where he went from Mecca to Jerusalem on the winged horse, had his experience there. But the uh, Surah An-Najm, yeah. which is a different chapter of the Quran, talks about his uh, spiritual ascension okay. to, to paradise, and to, 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 to heaven, and to see paradise, and saw hell, etc. So they're two separate experiences. The first thing to mention, the this specific incident where he flew to Jerusalem. And Isra means night journey. Isra just means night yeah. journey. It says it there, Subhanallah, Asra bi abdihi. Okay. Yeah? Glory be to him who carried his servant by night. So the entire purpose of this journey, so, and it was a spiritual experience as Ahmadis, we believe. It wasn't a physical thing. It was actually in a way more than a spirit, physical thing. It was actually a full expression of his soul hmm. and a manifestation and a vision of the highest order for his soul to experience. And what did he see? So he went to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. which didn't have the Al-Aqsa Mosque complex, didn't have the Haram Al-Sharif, right there, not the Haram Al-Sharif, the uh, Al-Haram of yeah. the of, at Jerusalem. It, it was whatever was there at the time. And he saw that he was leading the all of the past prophets in prayer. Wow. Okay. So that, in a way, established, and what that demonstrated is that there would, whatever you take Al-Aqsa to be, yeah. and we can go into that, you'll be able to explain that better than I will. Whatever we take Al-Aqsa to be, it is it represents a place or a situation or a condition in which the proof of the Prophet Muhammad's superiority is demonstrated and the proof of Islam's superiority is demonstrated over all previous prophets and teachings. That's right. the point of Al-Aqsa. That's why it begins with Subhanallah, glory. This was a representation of the glory of Islam, mm. right? And the greatness of Islam over all other religions. Mm. And that's why it's headed at the beginning of a chapter called Bani Israel, mm. the tribes of Israel, because it was the tribes of Israel who prided themselves that prophethood was theirs. Mm. So God was breaking their notions of religious supremacy by saying, not only is the prophet being taken away from you, but the greatest prophet hasn't been born among you. And the vision I'm going to put at the beginning of the chapter of my revelation mm. is about the glory of that new religion, right? Mm. Which establishes its superiority over your, 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 uh, your religious heritage. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so then as you say, it's a vision. These visions spiritually have meaning, yeah. and that meaning is that it shows the glory of, of Islam. So I guess the question Muslims should be asking themselves or is, why did that have to happen in Al-Aqsa? Why did it have to happen in a distant place? What does that symbolize, mm. right? Now, uh, my mind is drawn to um, Surah Al-Jumma, okay, which talks about where the Prophet, peace be upon him, is said to have come among the Arabs, who is who is raised among the uh, the Arabs. The unlettered uh, peoples. Yeah, sorry. The, who is raised among the unlettered people, a prophet who purifies them and shows them his sign and teaches them the, um, the, uh, the law and the wisdom. Uh, and, then it lay, and then it says in the, in the next verse, and he will raise 
Have you got it there? Yeah. He will, yeah. And among and he will raise them among others from among them who have not yet joined them. And he is the mighty, the wise. So the prophet, peace be upon him, is described as coming amongst the, the Arabs, the unlettered people, and he will be raised amongst another people who have not yet joined them. Now, what did, uh, you know, the, famously, the companions who are around him asked him, who are these people? Yeah, who are these other people? Who are these you're other gonna people? You're going to come again amongst. Yeah, you're going to come amongst these other people. Who are these people? And what did the prophet say? The prophet actually looked towards one of his companions who was next to him, who was Salman al-Farsi. And the reason he was called Farsi is because he was famously the Persian companion. Okay. Mm. And he said, he put his hand on his shoulder and he said to him that a man from amongst these people or men from amongst these people, from the mm. people of the Persians, will raise, in a, they will come. And what they will do is they will bring faith back from the Pleiades where it will have ascended to. The okay. Pleiades being uh, the... But the star, the brightest star the in, brightest, the, in, yeah. in the in the in the what it refers sky. to the star so far away that the faith will go so far away we'll from its earth. origin, will leave the earth. Wow, in a sense that someone will have to come to bring it back, and there will be a Persian origin. There will be a Persian origin. Okay, so that's wonderful because he described uh, what the Quran describes as his coming. Mm. He described as a Persian's coming. Yeah. So, it, which demonstrates the, the concept of the second coming of anybody. According to the Quran, yeah, means a different person, even though God gives it the same name as the first person. Yeah, even though the Prophet Muhammad is described as coming again, the Prophet Muhammad in Tafsir Sahih Bukhari, which is where this in the hadith is, yeah. he said that it is. And it's also in Sahih Muslim as well. So it's like you know, it's about as authoritative as it gets. Um, that he, he will not come again. A Persian would come again, and the Prophet Muhammad could never be a Persian mm. because he was an Arab. Okay, <laughs> so mm. you know. So in the night journey, we have the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It's a great parallel. I never brought the parallel between Bani Israel and uh, and and this chapter. It's a very good parallel. Well, mm. well, I mean, so I mean, and it's very instructive because it said, you know, in, in the night journey, he is taken to a distant place where he is shown to be superior to all the other prophets. Yeah. Uh, through his through him being Khatim and Nabiyin. Yeah. Right. And in this chapter, we're told that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, will come again. Among right? another people. Among another people, right? Yeah. And we in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, can you tell us about how we how we join these two up in, in the coming of, of, the, of the Prophet Messiah? Yeah, so I guess what we're saying is perhaps Al-Aqsa, so we're talking about the furthest, we're talking about temporally. So we're talking about the fact that the superiority of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, will live on for a really, really long time. Mm. And um, the fact, what, what you mentioned, Brother Rohan, about faith ascending to the Pleiades and then returning, it talks about the current time. So what, what this is about is the fact that faith really will depart from the hearts of Muslims mm. and really materialism, as is what's happening now, will reign supreme and people will forget about religion. And this is just as in the time of Jesus, whereby... Right. Um, at the time of Jesus, again, there was a hyper-materialistic society. And Jesus came 1,400 years after the prophet Moses, peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. And he came in order to fulfill the law. He said, I've not come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfill it. And it's a similar relationship, not identical, but similar in the relationship between the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was the law-bearing prophet of that time. Of all, for time. all times. But, but he was sent at that particular time. And 1400 years later came Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, who yeah. we believe to be the promised Messiah. Well, 1250 years, 13th century. We're now yeah. 1400 years later. Yeah, yeah. at the yeah. end of the yeah. 14th century. So there's a great parallel between the two things. And it shows that really the Khatam and Abin, which means the seal of the prophets, mm. really it means the seal of, in a way, authentication. So the Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed demonstrated those qualities. Mm of the holy of the prophet muhammad peace be upon him mm. and in a way they're like the same person because they have the same message they teach the same law and they have the same personal qualities but obviously the prophet muhammad peace be upon him is vastly superior yeah. in terms of spiritual status and and, and the quran mentions but, that he is the seal of the prophets he said you know mm. muhammad peace be upon him is not the father of any of your men but he is the uh, the messenger of Allah, messenger of Allah, and the seal of the prophets. He's not the father mm -hmm. of any of your men, but indicates that actually he will have spiritual sons, right? Yeah, and that is what's referred to in the night journey. And as you've exactly said, this was fulfilled through Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, who came in in the same time span as Jesus came after Moses to reform the Muslims 
when the Muslims had become like the Jews. Yeah. So it yeah. all ties together and only Ahmadiyya theology can tie things together like this. And, and also not just uh, coming at the same time, but his solution was the same. Right. So Jesus was a prophet of demonstrating mercy and compassion and forgiveness mm. at a time where the people's hearts were hardened. Mm. And it's the same with now, we see the Muslim world and it's filled with you know, people trying to wage war, people, you know, very harsh. Using religion for using religion gain. For, yes, yes. And doing it in quite a harsh way. Mm. And Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, peace be upon him, demonstrated messianic, Jesus-like qualities yeah. in the sense that he highlighted the merciful aspects mm. of Islam. Yeah. Uh, and so this, the diagnosis is the same and the spiritual solution is the same. Absolutely. So, so, and, and it indicates that Al-Aqsa, you know, what we're really saying is that the Al-Aqsa spoken about in the Holy Quran is not a place. It is a hmm. time. It is an age. Yeah. It is an era. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his message would live on and it would manifest again in glory in the time that we live in now through the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, through Hazrat Zuhulam Ahmad, who was the Messiah and the Mahdi. He was the Messiah for the non-Muslims. So for the Jews to come in, for the Christians to come in, and he was the Mahdi, the guided leader to reform the Muslims. What I, what I want to point out is that the Al-Aqsa here is very interesting because um, Aqsa indeed means the distant, right? Mm -hmm. The distant mosque. But um, because it says, it says there, you know, Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Ladhi, yeah? Yeah. So Jerusalem is not that far from <laughs> Mecca. That's true. If you look at the whole of the world, Jerusalem is actually pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, they could get there through the. They you could know, get there. Yeah. They knew the campaign. place. They would have traveled there. They would have, you know, it's not an unknown place. So for the Quran to describe it as the distant place, the mm. distant mosque is actually, it's not an accurate description. Mm. If it's Jerusalem physically you're talking about. And distant can mean more just temporal. More yeah, just of course, distant. I mean, distant in time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And 13 centuries is certainly distant. And what's very interesting is that, you know, when was the Prophet Muhammad to come again? He was to come again at a time when uh, his character would be tarnished, when his message would be dragged through the mud, okay? And that was the age in which he would be needed to be manifested again, mm -hmm. right? And that was the age in which his superiority of his teaching was to be demonstrated over all other faiths. Also at a time when all other faiths would have established themselves in the world would be known, mm. right? When the world was a global village and right. when it would be possible for one message to dominate all over the others. And now we see after the coming of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, you know, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad was born in 1835 and died in 1908. 1901, 1900 was the peak of the Christian empire. The world's biggest ever Christian empire was the British empire, yeah. right? They had conquered North America, Austra Australasia, um, India, vast swathes of Africa. They were the peak of their power. And it was through his prayers that only 120 years later, in the seat of the nation in which that empire sprang forth from, mm. we just had a census this year or last year showing that less than 50% of this country is now Christian. That less than 50% of this country is now Christian. Yeah. That is mm. an astonishing destruction of the religious foundation which sought to eradicate Islam from the world, mm. which is Christianity. And he did it entirely through his prayers. Yeah. It was through his prayers that this change over a century occurred. Very messianic. Mm. Well, extreme, that is the definition of messianic. And, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that the Muslims and the Jews would become very much like each other. We've discussed this before, like, you know, two pairs of, uh, a pair of shoes, they're the right to the left. And what's significant to me, especially, is that, you know, the the temple was, Jerusalem seems to be a weather vane, yeah. in some respects, of God's uh, favor and disfavor. We saw it with the Jews, how when they became corrupt, the temple was destroyed and they had to go through reformation for it to be rebuilt. And then when they uh, rejected Jesus, peace be upon him, it was destroyed finally. Hmm. It's still destroyed, right? But that, that, uh, that region, that place came under the rule of the Muslims through the beautiful you know, method of the, of the Caliph Umar. Yeah. You know, may Allah be pleased with him. And it stayed under the Muslims. Until a few hundred years later, like you had with the Jews, it was temporarily taken away by the Christians in the Crusades. Yeah. And then a great ruler, Salah Hazrat Salahuddin, came, Saladin, came and restored it back to the Muslims and they've kept it until the current era where, like you said, 40 years after they have um, rejected, you know, many have rejected the the, the, the Messiah, the Muslim Messiah, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, Israel was set up and now they're in conflict and Muslims are clearly undergoing enormous hardship across the world. And right now, obviously, especially in, Gaza. In, in Palestine. Yeah, and we mentioned earlier how we should look at the story of Solomon's destruction of the temple as a lesson yeah. to learn from. 
Uh, we saw this happen again at the time of the Romans and Jesus, right? Now, in this day and age, Muslims should also reflect. And you mm. mentioned that uh, Jerusalem seems to be uh, a place which is dependent upon the favor or disfavor of God, yeah. right? And this is a prophecy of the Quran as well. We've discussed this previously in a video you both have. And uh, so the Muslims should reflect over what actions they're currently doing and why is it that over the last uh, 100 years or so, 70, 80 years, let's say, that they've been slowly losing control over that land of Palestine, yeah. of Jerusalem, which they've lost control now. Yeah. And now they are uh, fear that the last bit of power or uh, symbolism that they have, which is Al-Aqsa, yeah. they're about to lose that as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and, that's, mm, and that's at the that's at the centre of Hamas's actions on October 7th. And, and you know, Sunni, Sunni Muslims will sometimes accuse Apathies, they'll say, oh, you know, what you're saying because the Palestinians are suffering that they deserve it. That's not what we're saying, actually, at all. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, famously said that when punishments come across nations, individuals will be judged according to their own deeds. So it's not. it does not mean that every person who is martyred and killed in these conflicts is um, is condemned, not at all. But actually, you know, the, why aren't the Muslims reflecting yeah. on, on their own conduct? Clearly, yeah. there is disfavor upon the Muslims. Clearly, Muslims are being punished. So rather than accusing us, who say we have a pretty plausible solution yeah. as to how to uh, remove this disfavor of Allah, why aren't they reflecting upon their own conduct and saying, well, actually, maybe we are doing things. Maybe we are under the wrath of God. And maybe if we reform, the Palestinians would be saved. Yeah. Instead, they look yeah. at us in anger. E even from a practical point of view, you know, if they were simply to stand up for the Palestinian rights yeah. and come together from a political standpoint, yeah. that would demonstrate that they had some form of backbone, yeah. that they didn't entirely prioritize their worldly gains, which mm. is what they're doing. Mm. You know, the reason they don't want to take any action against Israel is because they've got uh, industrial ties, uh, uh, trade ties. They don't want to uh, issue any kind of raise in oil prices because that would you know affect their uh their oil sale etc and commodity so their political concerns are greater and their economic concerns are greater than mm. standing up for the palestinian rights and yeah. that's been the case for 70 something years yeah right mm -hmm. so that's that's a that even if we take it away from the kind of overt religious spiritual aspect of it yeah. just look at it from the political weakness yeah perspective of it that's also a proof that they have uh, degenerated morally yeah I guess the other like religious lesson to draw from all this is that you don't need to try and hasten the coming of a messiah. <laughs> so you don't need to sort of wage wars or destroy mosques or yeah. do any of this kind of thing. And that, that's not how religion has ever worked. You don't need to build a third temple as Israel Ariel wants to do so that then Jesus, well, their Messiah could come after that mm. and that it would only be fit for him. In fact, Jesus, who was the true Messiah of that time, did the opposite. Mm. He came and condemned the temple and everything in it. So it, it's it's kind of interesting. And our belief is that Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, who is the founder of the Ahmadi Muslim community, came before. He came first and then the signs came after. And I think you've talked about this as well quite a bit. That, yeah. you know, it's it's not that we as human beings try and make signs happen. We don't try and force God to bring a Messiah, yeah. but it's, you know, God has the power. Around. So yeah, basically yeah. Muslims, Muslims and Jews both need to stop um, trying to... They yeah. need to, Muslims and Jews both need to stop uh, making a timetable for God. Yeah. They need to follow God's timetable. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the mistake that everyone's been making. And the signs making. always come after... The contemporaneous claim. and after they come contemporaneous or after the claimant they yeah. certainly come after the claim if you ask somebody well, what were the signs of the time of jesus can you point to any signs before he came not really can you yeah. just point to signs after he came yeah certainly any signs mm. before the prophet muhammad was born before he made his claim to prophethood no people didn't know him he was an ordinary meccan they loved yeah. him they was one of their favorite amongst them they called him alamin and al-sadiq but he was not known outside of his tribe outside of his village mm. outside of his town right so the signs for his truth came after his prophetic claim. Yeah. So the mm -hmm. idea that, oh, well, the Messiah is going to be completely different. You know, all the signs are going to be fulfilled before and he's going to then come when all the signs have been fulfilled. It's nonsense because the point of the signs is to demonstrate who is the truthful and who is the false. Bear witness. They're yeah. to bear yeah. witness. They're called a shaheed because they are witnesses, yeah. right? So they can't witness something that hasn't happened yet. Mm. And if they come before the claimant comes, mm. then anyone can stand up and say those signs were for me. Mm. In which case they don't discriminate between the truthful and the false. This is why I personally think, personally, I think, you know, if any Sunni Muslim didn't want to debate, debate us on the question of is Mirza Ghulam Ahmed the a Nabi? Is he the true Messiah? It's actually a very easy debate. Very easy debate. You just say, 
Do you watch all of those Hamza Yusuf videos? Do you watch all of those Omar Suleiman videos? Do you watch all of those, you know, what are the other Sunni scholars that we got going? Mufti Mank. Mufti Mank on the side. <laughs> Why did you say one? that in Paris? <laughs> Mufti Mank. <laughs> <laughs> Well, have you watched all these videos go, the signs have appeared, the Messiah is coming. Yeah. yeah. You, what, you watch all those videos, you accept them, you're like typing down the list, you're making a timetable, like, oh, this sign's beautiful, this sign's beautiful, this sign's beautiful. Okay, do the signs come before or after a claimant? That's all you need to ask. Yeah. That yeah. proves the truth of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed to a T. And as the Quran says, Allah never punishes until he sends a messenger. And the Muslims are clearly being punished. So they need to look for the messenger. Which they admit. Yeah. There's not a single Muslim scholar that I've come across who doesn't admit the fact that they're being punished right now. Why yeah. are you being punished? But well, the Quran clearly says you will only be punished once a warner has been sent. Yeah. yeah. The well, same with uh, Christians and Jews as well. I'm listening to a podcast. I, I was listening to one called The Chronicles. You're not doing it right now? The Chronicles of the Impressive. End Times, which is a Christian podcast. I thought it was The Chronicles of Riddick. I was like, is that no, I think it's well? called The Chronicles <laughs> of the End Times. And uh, they end their episodes by saying, keep looking up, the king is coming. <laughs> and they should think, well, if the, if the signs of the end times have come, maybe it means that the king has already come. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much for watching. If you like this, check out our next video on the Red Heifer Prophecy. Make sure you like, comment and subscribe. Check out rationalreligion.co.uk for much more content. Thank you. And if you don't normal, we'll find out where you live. <laughs> yes, he already does know. <laughs> <laughs>